live. John, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today and coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So as I told you just a few seconds ago, I like to ask my guests in the beginning if there's a little tidbit, a little story, a little something. I mean, you're out there, but that the world maybe doesn't already know about you. Uh, I take a lot of long walks. People don't know that to relax. And I like classical music. So uh, I'll walk and I'll listen to something real soft and uh, helps me think and helps me relax. And I don't think too many people know that. Not too many people, I imagine, do know that. So talk to me a little bit about, um, we'll kind of go reverse chronological. What's it been like, uh, you know, in time after all of your life, your your long life after jail, after all of that, um, just kind of getting back, getting acclimated into regular society? Well, I, I think I look at my life as uh, from 10 years, nine years ago, about a decade now, uh, is it's a new start for me, new beginning, and uh, I'm doing things like the Second Chance program, and that's what my life's about now. I really don't go backwards and, and think about my past because it's done. So it's uh, today, the present, future. Beautiful. And so, all right, now let's let's go from the beginning. <laughs> um, will you just kind of for you know? I mean, I've listened to a bunch of your interviews, uh, a lot of great ones out there, uh, but no one's gonna sit, tell it better than you. Will you kind of talk about? Um, from the beginning, how you got into, uh, you know, the life? Well, I, I got involved in the uh, mob world because of family, uh, father, uncles involved with different gangsters that uh, they grew up with, that uh, they introduced me to since a child. And from there, I got involved in my, in my area also with uh, the Ruggiano family, who uh, Andy Ruggiano was the uh, boss in our neighborhood, captain, uh, he was a guy that was made by Albert Anastasia in the 50s, and his sons were uh, became very good friends of mine, and one son became the baseball coach, uh, Albert. The other son, Anthony, uh, was kind of uh, a guy that uh, was always around and since we're kids. So, uh, you know, I got uh, accustomed to being around gangsters, and especially top gangsters like Andy Ruggiano. And so do you remember that first... Uh the first day you were introduced to, you know, one of those top gangsters. What's going on through your head? How old are you? I'm a baby. I meet uh, a Charlie Luciano. I meet a guy, Little Al, a good-looking Jack, they used to call another guy. These guys were uh, top guys as gangsters back in those days. And like I said, you know, Andy Ruggiano, since I'm a kid, was uh, almost, you know, you looked up to him as a grandfather figure when you're a baby. I'm, I'm three, four years old when I'm meeting all these guys. Andy, I meet a little later on, probably about seven or eight. So uh, I, I really know who they are already. Uh, I've been schooled since I'm a baby around them. So I know the difference between the bad guys and the good guys when you're a kid, cops and robbers. So, you know, when people say that, uh, you know, you didn't know who they were or I didn't realize they were gangsters, to me, that's nonsense if you grew up around them. What did you think that... Uh a gangster did when you were when you were young did you know exactly i mean you say you know what they did but do you know like did you know all the details did you know in your mind were the cops the bad guys were the gangsters the good guys what was that like well i knew they smoked good cigars and dressed well and uh, drove nice cars that's as a kid that's all you want to know right but uh, yeah i was raised as uh, the cops were the bad guys i mean that was you know the way we were raised unfortunately that's not reality of life you know you got to judge people by people so but as a kid, that's just exactly you're you know you're accustomed to uh, almost being brainwashed uh, against uh, you know the uh, the norm you know what goes on in society and you know I become a rebel I guess since I'm a kid and I, I just kept going that way for a while. And about at what age did you know, you know I'm gonna probably get into this? <clears throat> uh, probably about five years old. Wow. So you know when I'm a kid, I'm looking up to it. So. And I'm watching these guys, and they're all hanging out together, laughing, telling jokes. I'm watching them, you know, serious money, gambling, big money, card games. But I also see the games around the two, the fun stuff. They're throwing water on each other. They're teasing each other. They're playing jokes on each other. And, you know, that camaraderie, you start to, you know, you look up to these guys, and you're watching them giving you, you know, back as a kid, 50 and 100 bucks, which is incredible money. And I'm like, oh, I want to do what they're doing, smoke good cigars. And, you know, and I used to run around like, with toys and you'd put it in your mouth like it's a cigar and you'd pretend to be good looking Jackie or you pretend to be uh, Charlie Luciano Blackie and you know that's who I pretended to be I didn't pretend to be a baseball player and you said your your family was uh, were they involved heavily involved uh, earlier on 
uh, not really. My father wasn't a, a, a gangster like I was. He hung around. He was a gambler. He was a, you know, a guy that you know, liked staying in the street, and he didn't go to school. I believe he only went to the second grade or something. I mean, later on, he did stay with some bad guys. He made the headlines of the Daily News as a kid. Him, uh, my Uncle Max, and a good friend of his, Red Kelly, got shot up by a cop. And it was the front page of the uh, New York Daily News. So, yeah, I mean, he wasn't small time either at the same time, but he wasn't a shooter like me that I became. Did you know? Did he ever try to uh, make sure that you wouldn't get into that life? Or he was like, yeah, you know, he can get into it. No, he definitely didn't want me in the life. But he also had me around them. So it was too late for me. I, I couldn't be who my father was. My father was just a, a regular nice guy, you know, a boxer. He was in the gym all the time. He was in the Navy. He was a fighter in the Navy. And he thought I could separate the street fighting and the, uh, you know, the shooting like he did to just gambling and, you know, being a boxer in a ring. But I took it to other levels. So speaking of other levels, when when was the first time um, you were asked to do, uh, you know, a task that was, you know, crossing and for, for a lot of people crossing that line into violence and, you know, shooting up people and stuff like that? Uh, the first time, I guess, was collecting money as a kid, 14, 15 years old, for uh, Louis Gaddy, who was a Lucchese soldier. And his brother was uh, also a soldier. And his his daughter was my girlfriend as a, as a young kid, 10 years old. So they would ask me to do certain things for them. And it stepped up from just collecting and you know dropping off slips to, can you go threaten this guy? Can you go, and then it became, can you hit this guy? Can you take a couple of your friends? Can you baseball bat this guy? And, you know, I, I started doing those things for them. And where did that, uh, in your mind, was that, did you, did you ever fear, um, you know, going to collect the money and then, you know, hitting those guys, baseball bats, shooting? Was there ever a fear or was it just this is business? No, nah, there was no fear. It was, uh, you know, you, you kind of wanted to prove yourself and uh, you did it just like you would do any other task, I guess. And, you know, somebody doing homework at, at school it was to me that was my homework, and I was going to make sure I did it. What did you feel like you had to prove? Uh, I just wanted to be who these guys were. It's not really you're proving anything to you know to yourself. You're proving to them you can be just like them, or what you set in your mind you think they are. And what did you? What was it about that that appealed perhaps the most? Was it just the money, the cars, the the everything like that, or was it also perhaps the fame, perhaps the respect? Nah, as you're a kid, you don't even think about the fame part. You just think about the uh, the money, and you think about the uh, the uh, pull you have in the area as far as what you want or what you need, or you know you want a car or you need a favor. If you you, you want to get a car, you can he'll send you to somebody that uh, you know was in the car business, and they'll make sure you get you a good deal, and you're not going to pay the price that an average guy is going to pay. So, and just a little background, where. Uh what neighborhood was it that you grew up in? I grew up in Woodhaven. Okay. Uh, Woodhaven, Jamaica Avenue. It was on the border in you know, East New York, Jamaica Avenue. But I ran those streets from, I guess, East New York, Brooklyn, uh, Jamaica Avenue, all the way down to South Jamaica, where uh, Supreme was and those guys and the Supreme team and you know, McGriff, that is, and his uh, nephew, uh, Prince. And so then you're, you're doing these tasks. And then how is this, this trust kind of building between you and and the family and the and the bosses? Well, it was kind of an easy fit because I grew up around uh, the Ruggianos who were, uh, the, the sons were very easy going, nice guys. They weren't typical, uh, you know, a lot of times you got uh, mob guys or just anybody whose father's in a position. It doesn't even have to be that politically. Their kids uh, have a little entitlement uh, belief in themselves. Uh, Albert and Anthony weren't those type of guys. Their father really raised them as gentlemen and nice guys, and uh, they didn't have that attitude. So I fit in with them because they know me since I'm a baby. They used to pick me up, put, them on, put me on their shoulders. I was a small kid. They were, you know, four and uh, six or seven years older than me. And, uh, you know, it was just a natural thing as a friend, true friendship, really. So that's interesting because I think there was one interview that I heard you talk about how Reflecting now, you realize there's not a lot of, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, not word for word, but that there was no true friendship in this life. And that maybe in the beginning, you, as you just said, you did feel like there was true friendship. Well, uh, you know, not to contradict myself or what you just said, but the true friendship was the Ruggianos because okay. those were typical friends. Gotcha. They weren't relationships that you make in the mob world because the, the relationships you make in the mob world aren't true friends. They're just business friends. 
So that's what I mean by saying that. So when you meet a guy like Andy Ruggiano, he was a different guy. He was a different character. And he grew up in a true era of the mafia when Murder Incorporated and Albert Anastasio and Carlo Gambino and Neil Della Croce, some famous uh, mob names were around. Uh, Andy was, which, you know, guys would say, a man's man, a tough guy, a, uh, you know, a true gangster. You know, he lived for, he breathed through it, but he also taught me things that didn't really exist later on in the mob world of loyalty and, and true friendship. And and to, to this day, I'm still friends with the Ruggiano sons, with Albert and Anthony. So uh, it's a different uh, mindset. Would you say those are were the only true friends that you had and still have over the course of your life in, in the, the mob? In the mob world, for the most part, I mean, I had a couple other guys, who, you know, that got out of the life, like Robert Engels and different guys that I stayed friends with over the years. And, you know, we understand the, the, the street from back then uh, till now. But you got to remember, I was born in 62, so it was a different era. And when you go into today's era, it's a completely different era because of technology, because of cameras, because of the violence in our era. You know, in our era, a lot of my friends, true friends, are dead. And I can run through guys, dozens of them, but uh, were real good friends of mine that grew up in the same era as me, and they're dead. And maybe if they were alive, they would have stayed true friends, but uh, they're all gone. So it's very difficult for me to say, besides my regular friends that I went to play baseball with, or I went to school with as a kid. A lot of these guys, like the Jones boys and the Peter Grimm and some of these guys, were, or Richie Langston actually is one of these guys that I grew up since a kid, neighborhood guy, that helped me through changing my life. So I look through at these guys, and I, you know, I, I got a different respect for them. And I think there was uh, also in another interview you said whatever it was that you were going to do, you had to be the best at it. Whether it was boxing, whether it was baseball, you just need to be the best. For you, when you you know started uh, being the the hitman for the for the Gotties, was it? Did you have to be the best at it? Was it that same kind of mindset? Yeah, I mean, I worked in a deli, right? And they asked me to clean the floor when I worked there. I wanted to make sure I cleaned it right. And people ask, you know, why are you so obsessive? And I was, it's because you take it pride in in what you're doing. So it doesn't matter if it's cleaning floors. It doesn't matter if you you know you're serving McDonald's. Uh, if you work at McDonald's, because I see I talk about this a lot. You got a lot of guys in jail that are cleaning toilets. They're, they're washing floors. They're uh, taking out garbage, but they wouldn't work at McDonald's when they're on the street. I just don't get that you know mindset. If you're doing it in prison, why didn't we? Why didn't all of us do it in the street? So you know you got to change some of these young guys' minds and and, and tell them listen. You know, work is work, so you should take pride in it. And if you're making a legitimate dollar, I should take pride in that. Uh, you don't have to get rich to be rich within your soul, you know. And it means something to, to try to pass and convey that message. Yeah. And and so, okay, so now, you're, what, what was the first age that you were asked to, to put a hit on someone? Uh, I was young. I was about 19 years old, I guess. I just got stabbed up myself, and I went on a shooting. Uh, uh, I think it was about four Jamaican guys. I was the driver. I wasn't the actual shooter. And was we describe that that mindset being 19 years old, even if you know you're you're the driver of like, is there? Are you, do you fear your life? I mean, you, you mentioned that you had just you know had gotten stabbed. Uh, yeah, I was stabbed, baseball batted, and uh, hit by a car. So my mindset is uh, it's kind of I'm already in this life. I've already watched other people get killed. You know, growing up as a kid, I grew up in a bad neighborhood. So, you know, our neighborhood was, uh, you're, you're watching guys constantly getting baseball batted or stabbed up or, you know, just natural deaths in our neighborhood, which natural deaths is ODing from uh, shooting up or, or taking pills or drugs. So I've seen a lot of death already at that time. And I, and I've seen some of my friends a, a couple steps ahead of me that are already killing guys. So this wasn't... You know, to me, to you know, go on my first hit was uh, just a natural occurrence like anything else. I didn't really, you know, take that as, you know, people say, well, was that an extreme thing for you? Can you remember all the details? And I kind of thought the guys that were involved on that hit were going to be, because they were a little step ahead of me also. They were using guns already, this guy Johnny Gebbett. And, and uh, I was uh, surprised that they didn't have the uh, courage to do what they were supposed to do. I just thought it was not, it was very, honestly, it was natural to me, and it wasn't a big deal at the time. And when I was finished with it, I was disappointed in the guys that were along with me on that hit. Did you ever fear death? Uh, different types of death. Not from the street, not from a gun, not from fighting, but I feared it in heights. I don't like buildings. I don't like, I didn't like to fly a lot. I mean, I, I fly a lot, but I don't like it. So I guess uh, that question is also uh, 
two-way sword, I guess, because, uh, you know, there's certain things about it. I guess the way you're going to die, I choose to die in a way I want to die, in my mind, you know, and the, the other's part of dying a different way, I guess I fear it, yeah. Wow. Okay, so then, so you say you were kind of disappointed in the way that they, you know, went carried up. themselves, yeah. And how did that kind of trigger then when you were asked to then put a hit on other people and do the shooting yourself? How did that change you and... And how did you approach the first time that uh, you were asked to do the, the, the killing yourself? Well, I think, you know, and I've said this before, I think hurting somebody, killing somebody, you learn to, to take uh, steps where you're not going to get caught. So the easy thing is to do the work, for me anyway. The hard part is to make sure you take steps that you're going to be successful in doing what you want to do. But I started understanding also prior to that, you know, I was relying on a team of guys to do that hit. After that situation, I only relied on myself. I don't care if there was two guys with me or four guys. I was going to make sure and just rely on myself that I knew if these three guys or two guys or four guys that was with me wasn't going to do their duty or their job, I was going to make sure that I was going to finish it somehow. So I would be more prepared to do that job and make sure it was done right with my own abilities, not with relying on the other guys that are with me. And, I, and I've heard you say that multiple times about how uh, the killing was the easy part. It was more like to not kill was the harder part. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, even today after I changed my life, uh, the you know the tough part about is learning to control your your impulses and your temper. And Sammy Gravano's uh, the the underboss at the time with the, the Gambino family, who's a friend of mine, and he says it pretty well if you hear him talk about it. he's an intelligent guy and he understands the life he was raised in life he's an you know an ex-army guy and you know armed forces but he says it pretty well that uh you know the planning aspect of doing these uh killings these beatings these shootings is uh just as important as somebody that's going to pull that trigger and you don't have to be the guy pulling the trigger all the time to be successful and unfortunately in a, in a bad life that we chose so it's a profession that we chose that uh, obviously isn't, a, isn't, I talk against that life now, but at the time you have to be prepared like anything else. And you, you know, part of that is planning. Was there also a, a mental preparation when you knew perhaps the night before or on your way to, to go kill someone? I mean, what, describe the, the mindset for someone who, you know, perhaps has never experienced that. What is that, what's going on in your head? Are you just, you know, because to some people, they might listen and be like, this guy sounds stone cold. You know what I mean? But is that is that what's going through your head? No, that's not the case. I mean, honestly, unlike anybody else, I talk about a lot. I cry a lot. I have feelings. I mean, one of the things, it's like anything, preparation, preparation before a football game, a baseball game, a boxing match. Anybody that uh, does anything in, you know, sports or athletic or, you know, a dancer or whatever field they're in, I guess, you know, you got to be prepared. So... One of the things how I first started getting into classical music is what you're just saying. So, you know, I prepare myself by relaxing, right? Think, think what we're going to do, think it through. Here's where we're going to go. Here's where it's going to start. Here's where I want it to end. And here's where I want to be. And make sure everything's prepared to be successful in what you're doing and not get caught. And I think part of that relaxation was me taking those walks and listening to classical music, soft music. Oh, so you were taking the walks and the, listening to classical music before going on a killing? Oh, since I'm a kid. Oh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> that that's amazing. That I thought it was more like in your in your life post all this. Now you go on. So you would like. So you're say 25. You know you've got a hit that day. And you're going on a walk, listening to some classical music as kind of relaxing way to go about it. I used to yeah. I used to listen to classical. I listened to a lot of opera. Uh, when I was a kid, I drove a Corvette convertible, and people would hear me listening to, you know, Andre Bocelli or uh, uh, Pavarotti back then. I'm trying to think some of the names I listened to back then, and uh, Mario Lanza, that's an old timer. So I would actually have uh, opera on in my car, and people would be like, "What the hell is this guy listening to?" Or if I was dating a girl, and I'd put something like that on, or listen to classical or Barbra Streisand or somebody, they wouldn't understand why I was listening to that soft music. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So then, what was the? How old are you when you had to to execute your first killing yourself? Uh, I guess it was around twenty four, twenty five years old. And do you remember? Do you remember that day? Do you remember what that was like for you? It was just a typical day because a friend of mine rang my doorbell and asked me if I'd take a ride with him. 
And uh, I said, yeah. And I, we took a ride and we uh, killed two guys over a, a drug business unrelated to me. And uh, I was already shooting guys, so it wasn't a big deal to me if somebody lived or died at that time. You know, and I know that sounds cold, but it was just part of what I did. So when he said, he didn't say we're going to kill him, but I had a feeling that's what we were going to do. Did you ever have any uh, emotions post killing someone? I mean, I don't know how, you know, the details of whether you kill them and you, and you leave or if they're in front of you dead. Like, what is, are there any emotions when you see someone dead in front of you? Well, I don't think so. I think it's, you, you kind of mentally block it out. Um, during one of the trials, uh, one of the prosecutors asked me, what did I eat? And I, and I was kind of weird, like, what, why is he asking me what I ate afterwards? Because I guess he was trying to show that I really didn't care. It was just normal business for me, and I ate right afterwards. So obviously it didn't bother me too much to be eating and remember what I'm eating. But that's not really the case. You kind of block it out. I think you have those emotions, but it's like anything else. you got you know, good guys that are trying to kill me. Maybe they would have been my friends if I would have met them in a different light, but I met them as my enemy. And it's uh, either I got to kill them because they're going to kill one of our guys or one of our friends, so, or I got to kill them because they're trying to kill me. So it's a survival thing at the same time. And if you're going to exist in this world, uh, especially in the street, you have to be violent, you have to be good at what you're doing, and you have to be precise. And I learned to be those things. And I also am a guy that wants to be good at what I've done. Whether it's that and it's a negative way of, of living, I still wanted to be good at what I was doing. And how prepared, I mean, uh, in, your, in your preparations, how, how did you guys go about, you know, planning out what you guys were going to do? Does it take, you know, days, months, weeks, or is it just kind of like, I know this guy's going to be here at this time, like, let's go? Well, you know, I, over the years I've met guys that did some things, and one of the killings was uh, some mob guys. They weren't particularly great friends of mine. I met them in prison, and they were telling me about a hit they did, uh, and they hit the wrong guy. I think they hit the—I believe they hit the father or the son instead of the father, whatever. It was reversed, and they also hit a cop, and they said we didn't know it was a cop. In my mind, I'm saying, what are these guys, fucking morons? Didn't they do any homework? I mean, because when you're going to plan a hit, you're supposed to follow them. You're supposed to get a time frame of where they are, when they're at, and choose where the best place to hit the guy is. And you're supposed to do your homework, make sure this is what he looks like. So when, when I hear a, a guy say that, to me, that's got, that's got to be one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. I mean, don't, aren't you, you know, preparing for what you're doing? Aren't you ready to, you know, to do that piece of work, or we say piece of work, and you choose the location that's best for you? So... To, to me, this is part of the problem. You got a lot of dummies that could pull a trigger, but not, you know, anybody smart enough to plan a hit properly. And I think this is what Sammy was getting at. But also, it's not like everybody thinks. Every mob guy is not that intelligent, and very few are really pulling the trigger. You know, you got guys at sheep's. You know, maybe they're stealing the car for the hit or dropping the guns after the hit, but they're not actually the guys performing that hit. Well, that's one of the things that I was going to ask you about that I thought was really interesting in, in some of the previous interviews I've heard you talk about is uh, you talk about like, you know, this guy never had a gun. That guy never killed anyone. In your eyes, in order to be a, a true gangster, do you have to be the one? Do you have to kill someone? Well, you know, not necessarily. Listen, you're a nice guy, right? So if you stay with me on the street and you act like a tough guy, I got no respect for you. But if you act like a gentleman and you're just, you know, hanging out with me and you don't give that all out to other people. I says, then you're a good guy. But when you act like you're a tough guy and you're not, yeah, I got a big problem with him. I got no respect for those guys. So that's what I'm really trying to get at. And, okay. you know, most of these guys are full of shit is what I'm getting at. You know, there's a young kid I just put on. He just came home, Gene Borello. I just put him on. He, he's a, a cousin of the Ruggianos. And he stayed with a bunch of guys that are uh, never used a gun, never did anything. And they say they're gangsters. To me, I look at them as glorified, you know, drug dealers. They're selling some pot. They're selling some coke. They're running around like they're killers, and they never broke an egg. You know, never cracked an egg. So, you know, I look at the kid Gene, and even though his life went in the wrong path at one time, and now he's back, and he's trying to change his life. And that's what these programs like Second Chance are for, to, you know, influence these guys that, uh, listen, these guys are making all the money, and they never did anything. But yet they want you to do all the work. And then you're trying to change these kids, you know, mindset that this is the wrong path. And uh, hopefully they, they listen to what I say now, not what I did before. And so for you, um, so for you, who do you think are, uh, and also yourself included, 
some of the the biggest gangsters of all time in your eyes? Well, you know, there's two things. There's a, there's a gangster, then there's, you know, there's a mobster, there's earners, you know. So, you know, certain guys are earners, but they're not, they're not thugs, they're not gangsters. And then there's guys that are gangsters and thugs that are also earners, and they, they, they're a little bit more intelligent. So they can run a company, can run business, they understand the unions, they understand, you know, the, the manipulation of the Machiavelli that goes on, a treachery of the streets. But the problem is most of them are dummies. And I can use a, an example for you because I don't really like, you know, I'm, I'm listening to Pelosi today, the House Speaker. To me, she's one. Of, she's so full of shit. She's a dummy. She's not too intelligent. She stutters over her words. And everything she talks about is hating on somebody else because she's inferior. You know, so when you look at somebody and, you know, she does a lot of talking, but like, you know, uh, Salmani, uh, the uh, general that was just killed. Somehow Pelosi made that about herself and political, and she didn't talk about the problem. The problem was this is a guy that was plotting killing the United States soldiers, also trying to plot against the United States. So it's about that. It's not about her. It's not about politics. Somehow she's manipulated that situation, and she's talking about suppressing so many Iranians that hit the street and try to protest because they got no freedom. So, uh, you know, a woman can't even talk in their country. So when someone's talking about that guy losing his life, who gives a shit? He should lose his life. He's a terrorist. But, you know, so when you're looking at her as a politician of people that don't know any better, well, listen and respect her. No, she's an imbecile, really. And just sitting down and listening to some of the sound bites of her speaking, or how arrogant she is when somebody asks her a, a question from the newsroom that she doesn't like answering. So it's the same with the mob, and I'm going to relate it, because there's a lot of gangsters are dummies, complete imbeciles. You know, you talk to them for two seconds, you say, holy shit, I thought this guy was a gangster and he was intelligent. That's not true. There's 90% of them are really dummies, and 98%, 98 of them can't even earn a dollar or shoot a gun. And there is that 2%, and that's why they shine out in the street world. And who do you think, uh, in your eyes, was there anyone that, uh, in terms of like hitmen or people who were, you know, straight gangsters who were killing people that you looked up to? I mean, through the years, you look up to, you know, you, you, I think most people know the names, you know, uh, Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia, uh, Costello, uh, you know, Carlo Gambino. I personally still, and a lot of people will say he's crazy. I, I think Paul Castellano was a, a, a good gangster. And people say, ah, he was greedy, he was this. When someone brings the money he brought into the family, I says, and, and his own personal uh, wealth, it brings power. Money brings power. So when someone says to me, well, you know, it was a bad choice to make Paul Castellano a boss by Carlo, I don't agree. Carlo, I think, was very smart in what he did, bringing Paul in, because his underboss was Neil Della Croce, who was a gangster, who did understand things, who Paul did rely on. And they had a good working relationship, and Paul was a killer. Not by his own hand, but he was a killer. He was a strong boss when he needed to be. Now, there's things that, you know, guys like Sammy, and, you know, we're not going to agree on everything. You know, he didn't have a lot of respect for Paul for different reasons because of what he did in his personal life and all that. To me, that's outside of the mob world. It's, it's not our business. What he did personally, what is to me, is what he did for the Gambino family and the relationships he built with other families. And I think still today, he's got to be recognized as one of the top bosses because of the money he brought in. But then you have guys like, obviously, I think I'm a big fan of, and because I grew up around him, is Andy Ruggiano. He was a tough guy. He was a gentleman. He was quiet. He raised his sons right. His personal family, his kids were good kids. And uh, he was good to us, and he didn't have an ego. So when I look at guys like Sammy Gravano, and I say I like him, they say, why do you like the guy? Because he didn't have an ego. And when people say, well, he killed this, he did this, and, you know, my, one of my last interviews, they asked me that. I'm saying, listen, we're in business running a corporation like any other business. Part of our business is murder, unfortunately. It's just part of our life. And it's not about being a serial killer or not killing or killing too much. You know, nobody just kills. I mean, we all may sneak a murder here or there without the permission. But overall, the work that we're doing, 99% of it is being approved. I said, we're just not randomly doing what we want, or it's not an organization, right? Then it's just a bunch of cowboys running around, and that's not the, 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 the history of the mafia. We all know that. Do you feel like you can be a good guy and also be a murderer at the same time? I tried to be my whole life, and most people that know me outside of the mob world and— 
People say, well, you're pretty easy going. I would never think you did for this for a living because they have the belief that the, the loudest guy in the room is the toughest guy. or They're watching a guy that's benching 400 pounds and they, they think he's a tough guy. But that's what they use the, the gun for, right? And well, that's the same guy that's benching 400 pounds, can't step in a ring with a, a small fighter, somebody who's a wealth of weight. They'll knock him all over the ring. You know, so I think that... Uh, being a nice guy is, you know, the way you were, you were raised. Do you have a good heart or you don't? You know, it's one thing being a, a dummy and being abused, and it's another thing being a gentleman but not putting up with no shit from anybody. So I try to be that guy that was a gentleman and not putting up with no shit from anybody. And I'm also curious, I mean, this, this almost sounds like I'm asking rhetorically, but I'm, I'm genuinely interested when, you know, are you able to, 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 to go about, you know, business and, and, and killing people and then, are you able to, to, to kind of sleep at night and, and have no issues and and just feel uh, okay with yourself mentally? Is there any, were there, I mean, you know, you said you're, you're you know, you cry, you have, you have the emotions, but um, were there ever nights that, you know, it's restless and you wonder, is this the right life for me? Is this all okay? You know, it's funny that you say, is there nights? Most of my nights are restless, now and before. But do you think about all of your Well, past? I think subconsciously, no matter what I, I know I think of, you must think of it. Because it's not normal to be almost at war since you're a kid. Right. You know, since I'm, you know, a little kid, since I'm 14 or younger than that, I've watched death everywhere, right? Whether it's, you know, my neighborhood, we nicknamed it Death Haven for a reason. And people say, well, you know, I'm going to say, well, there's nothing to say. Everybody's dying some way or another. From, you know, that's what happens, I guess, in areas that are a little more, you know, you're from the street and you're growing up on the street. Things are going to happen if you're on the street. If you're home in your house, they ain't going to happen. So whether it's a drug, you know, OD or it's, you know, a robbery going bad or it's just a murder, or you're going to get yourself into trouble the more you're hanging out in the street, not being occupied. So I think that to answer your question is, uh, you know, you're not going to sleep well because it's just too much violence that going on in your life and i i don't know too many guys some guys say they sleep well ralph natale said that in philadelphia one of the you know the acting bosses and and i said he's full of shit i i don't think he's a bad guy ralph i just think he's lying do you feel like everything you did was worth it now when you look back on it yeah you know why i think it's worth it and i'll never talk negative about my life because i can't get it back and i took that po that negative life and i turned it into positive so maybe that's my path and that was when my karma and that was what god made planned for me i needed to do these things to be able to come and do what i'm doing now with kids and trying to save lives and doing second chance and i believe that i met paul natal and uh, Nutal and his wife tiffany and michael harry o'harris and these guys and and we're talking about saving some kids' lives, especially inner-city kids. You know, I'm a big advocate. I went to Brownsville, and I did things. I'm a big advocate. I got a lot of black friends. I grew up in a neighborhood. And I think it's, uh, you know, this is maybe what I was meant to do, is save some kids that don't have the opportunity. I don't believe in separatism. I believe that, you know, guys like Martin Luther King Jr., that for years he, he dedicated his life not to have that. And now... Uh, there's a lot of that BT and black awards, and I don't believe that should be. The, I think you got to get noticed and make uh, everybody else say, hey, I don't care if he's black. He wins that award because he's the best at it. And I don't like the idea to separate because I think you're fighting against what everybody fought for for years. So, uh, you know, and I tell my friends the same thing all the time. I don't like that you fill out an application and it says, are you black, white, or Hispanic? What the fuck does that got to do with anything? Just put your name down. And if you're best qualified for the job, that's who should get the job. And same thing with age. If a guy's 20, if a guy's 45, uh, he should be able to get that job. And if a guy comes out of jail and I got, I, you know, asked to, you know, to work for FedEx, he comes out of jail and he's better qualified. Why shouldn't he get that job? You know, he already did his time in prison. Give him an opportunity. So I think, you know, th this is one of the reasons I don't regret my past life because I have an opportunity now to try to make some of these things right for other people and save some kids that, you know, I didn't get the opportunity in my own life. Now, uh, since, you know, you've gotten out of jail, this is uh, the body of work that you're doing, and, and that's great. Do you feel like because you went to jail, do you think jail almost saved your life in, in a sense, um, in, the, in, a, you know, in a safety and logistical standpoint that, you know, no one could, or that going to jail got you off the street and got you potentially out of harm? And then also on the back end, once you got out, you started doing positive work for the community. Do you feel like 
you know, I mean, I can't imagine going to jail is, is pleasant at all, but do you feel like in a lot of ways it may have saved your life? I mean, listen, I think that things sometimes are meant to be, so I don't know if it saved my life or not. Maybe. I mean, maybe if I was on the street all those years, somebody would shot me in the head like it happened to a lot of my friends and it happened to a lot of my enemies. So maybe it's just meant to be, but it it's, doesn't matter if it was or it wasn't. You know, I'm on this path for a reason, and uh, I'm dedicated to saving some kids. I got a lot of my friends involved in it now. I have my friend TT that's very close to me since we're kids. He grew up in a rough neighborhood, you know, in uh, Brooklyn. And uh, so he grew up in East New York, that area, Brownsville, and all that section. So, you know, we're friends since we're kids, and we joke about it all the time. We say, listen, there's not too many of us left that are standing. Right. And there's got to be a reason why we're standing and let's do something good with it about it. And, you know, hopefully save some of those kids that maybe they're going to be who we were years ago and they don't make it. I have friends that they never found their bodies. I have friends that they found chopped up. I have, you know, enemies that we killed, that I killed. And like I said, you know, some of them I really regret and some of them I say, what happens if we would have met in a different way like me and you met? Maybe we would have advocated together to help some kids and save some kids' lives. So I don't have any regrets. Honestly, I, I think sometimes I wish it, you know, I never went to prison, but I did. Uh, and uh, if I can save some of those kids that are in jail now and hopefully get some of them out. And, you know, I've said this over and over. I was a drug dealer. I was a killer. I was a thief. I was a gangster. I did it for monetary reasons. You got guys going to jail. Uh, that are drug dealers because they're not really drug dealers. And Michael used this, Harry O'Harris used this. He said, I, wasn't a, I chose to sell drugs. But you got kids that are drug addicts. They're only out there hustling and robbing so they can get high. It needs to be recognized for what it is. They weren't me that wanted to be a criminal. These are just guys trying to get high. They're not criminals. I have an older son that's not a gangster. He went to jail and he's suffering from my past life. And, it, and it's not really fair, and, it, and that's just my son. But how about some of the kids that are in the same situation? That, you know, they need better opportunities and the, the opportunities of racism that needs to go away and not the rhetoric bullshit about Black Lives Matter because that's bullshit. Because every time a cop gets into a shooting, whether it's good or bad and kills a black kid, everybody's out in arms and running all over the street and all over the TV and all the politicians are running around, whether they're white or black, with the bullshit or... Nancy Pelosi's of the, the media, but we're from the street. We know bullshit when we see it, right? So when another black kid's killing another black kid, where is everybody? Because that's really a, a, a ton of those murders. What a cop does is, right or wrong, is a, a nil percent of really what's going on. So why isn't anybody ha helping these inner cities? I mean, really helping them. So I don't want to hear about Nancy Pelosi when she lives in a mansion in San Francisco when everybody else is living on the street there's needles all over our neighborhood. You can't clean that up. So, you know, stop bullshitting us. We're not, you know, politicians. We're from the street. We understand. We understand the lingo, so don't sell us no shit. And, and that's really the message, you know. Let's really do something instead of just talking about something. And I just want to bring you back really quick on something you said about uh, drug dealing. During your, your, your height of, um, you know, drug dealing and all of the activities you're taking part in, would you... Do you know how much money you were making, how much you were bringing in? What was the... At the, at yeah, the everybody prime? always asks that prime question. Listen, we made so much money, who knows? But I gave figures, and somebody just asked me again, is it a million? Was that gross? Was that net? I go, listen, one of the smallest drug deals I had working for me, and he you know, he said it in his own words on a show. On a, a, He did GQ with me, Stevie Newell. We were friends, we were enemies, and we're friends again. And I like him a lot. And uh, he was talking about how he watched captains and different guys answering to me. And I later on shot him and uh, he went in, against me during the, the courts, you know, trials. And then he's back for me. But one thing we did talk about is uh, the money he made. He was making 15, 20,000 cash back in the 80s, uh, uh, you know, his, uh, his end of it, which was nothing. And he said I was one of the smallest guys. So he says, I think John's not telling the truth that they made a lot more than a million a month. And... Uh, I mean, it could have been as much as, uh, honestly, three or five million. I don't know. We spent money like water, and uh, there was tons of guys around me. You know, I had my own guys. I had a good 20, 25 guys. Uh, I had 15 real close to me, and they're sending out packages for me. You know, a couple of keys, depending on the guy. One guy, five keys, another guy, three. Then they got an army of guys around them. They got guys under them. 
So really, I mean, there's hundreds of guys that are answering to me. And then I'm answering to, you know, obviously the hierarchy of the Gambino family. So, you know, you're talking about tons of guys out there. What do we really make? And who knows? I mean, that number is just astronomical. And the way we lived was just spending money like it was water, champagne every day, Cristal. You know, we're in a club five days a week. And we're gambling like crazy. We're traveling like crazy. We're buying cars like crazy, homes. So very hard to pinpoint the exact dollar. But when I say a million, eh, I think it's very, very conservative. And where, uh, and then and you also, so you talk about gambling. I mean, uh, I think there was one uh, thing that I, that I heard you talk about with, uh, you're involved with like Mets players and, and stuff like that. I mean, what's what's that like during the 80s when, you know, I mean, I know you're involved with sports books and stuff like that. We talk about all of those different kinds of activities and what you're partaking in your, yourself. Are you betting on sports? Is there also, I mean, I know there's a lot of other guys who, uh, you know, there's a lot of sports match fixing, um, all that kind of stuff that's going on during the time. Well, you got to remember, we're all in the 80s. We're all young. Bobby Chez is a, one of my best friends. He visited me in all prisons. I mean, he was a three-time champ uh, boxer. And, uh, you know, you got guys like him that are staying with me. You got Joe Klecko from the New York Jets at the time, uh, Gastino Jets. Uh, you got the New York Mets all staying. We're all staying at Channel 80. We're pulling up with boats, cigarette boats. We're all making money. They're young kids. We're young. And we're all having a good time. We're drinking champagne, dancing, doing drugs. And, you know, I grew up in a gambling family. My, my uncle was uh, Blackie's partner in a three-card Monty game in the Bronx, making millions. He used to joke about he was making more money than Reggie Jackson back then. So you understand the quality of money we're making, the type of money. And uh, my whole family's bookmakers, gamblers, but I wasn't a gambler. I was a bookmaker. And just recently I opened up uh, a consulting firm called a Light. Uh, sports.com i saw that online and uh, you know and the reason because i became an expert in the gambling business over the years i made millions in it over the years i was you know running books all over for 30 years and i decided to open this consulting firm with my partner peter and from he's from colorado and we have guys that analyze the game we have all the software and we have uh, about 25 30 guys that put this information together and so i'm on the other side of not really uh being a gambler but being a bookmaker and a guy that's analyzing these games to help these gamblers to beat those books because I understand the systems. You know, we have the knowledge because of the technology we have and the experts and the guys that have working for me. We know when a guy's injured. We know if he was hurt the week before. We know if another player just got divorced. I mean, years ago, Steve Garvey was some ball player for the Dodgers, but he was going through marital problems. Most people didn't know that. We did. So we have the edge on on you know on those games when he's playing we know he's not going to be playing at the same ability so some of this technology we have and you know years of uh, data to what we put together obviously it's going to help the gambling industry for guys that want to play and did you ever back in the day uh were aware of match fixing or fixed events of course i mean i stayed with one of the murders i was talking about double murders was with frankie burke and uh, his father was Jimmy DeBurk, who they talk about in Goodfellas. And I was very close with Frankie. And his father was uh, fixed all kinds of games. He was famous for the you know, college team that he, he took the whole team. So and in boxing world, we understand, uh, you know, Tony Atlas, to Teddy Atlas talks about uh, the uh, there's so many fights being thrown because it's one-on-one -on -one competition. In High Lie, I had guys I used to go up to Connecticut and pay off so they could throw a game for me. So any kind of game, tennis games, matches, or anything like this where you have just single players, it's a lot easier. But also there's refs uh, that were indicted over the years just recently, a couple of years back from Philadelphia, that was uh, giving some games up that we knew that he was going to throw. You know, you know, he'd call different fou fouls and penalties for us and different things to edge that game. Because if you have a great handicapper, if you watch uh, some of the, the games, you're talking about a half a point or one point. So it's very important to get, and I'll give you an example. During the playoff game just recently, uh, the Viking game, uh, our under and over was anything over 45. We said bet 45, it's going to go over. Now the game, might, I think landed on 46 or 47. I have the right lines. I got a smart line. So I'm telling my guys that, uh, you know, that calling my consulting firm, is if it's 45, if you get anything under under 46, take the game, you're going to win. And it was 45, I believe it landed on. Uh, it landed on 46, excuse me. So if you if you bet what I said, you win the game if you get a 45-point line. Now, oh. now how, how is it, uh, 
is it easy for you now to kind of stray away from I mean, you know, you were you're in a time where you knew how to make so much money so quickly and a lot of it of course is, you know, <coughs> against the law. How is it hard now to kind of knowing that there's ways to make really easy money to kind of stray away from that and live more of a, you know, bound by the law life? No, I, I think that, you know, if you're intelligent and I knew how to make an adjustment with my life, which I did, and consequences, because when you're younger and you're a little more cocky uh, and you don't really uh, realize the uh, life is beautiful. And you, if you don't really, if you take it for granted like we did and my friends did, you, you, you really don't understand the consequences of losing your life. Over the years of losing so many people to deaths and jails, you start to respect the consequences of life. So I changed my thinking pattern. And that's what I'm trying to tell kids. You know, you can get mad, but don't react. Don't have an impulse. And same things with making money. Uh, in the 80s, anybody that grew up in the 80s knew that cash was incredible, right? There was a big flow of money that anybody that was growing up in the 80s understood. There was so much cash around. But those days are over. This isn't the 80s. It's not the 90s. It's not even 2000 anymore. It's 2020, right? So it's the millennium. And the money's not the same. But you have to adjust yourself on how to make money. And uh, there's so many legitimate ways to do it. Be aggressive, be intelligent, take the time to put something together, don't be short-sighted, and you can make money. You just got to be that person and be positive and be that person as, uh, you know, I have a lot of uh, uh, respect for myself, and I, and I think that uh, I'm intelligent enough to reinvent myself, which I have done. And, it's, you know, people say, well, it's not an easy thing to do, and... You know, I got people that are always coming up to me and, you know, they tell me, you know, can you take my picture? Can you give me my autograph? And at first I didn't understand why. And I said, you know, people say, well, because you're a survivor. Then somebody just recently was an engineer said, uh, because you give people hope. And I always want to know why they're coming to me because I'm not an actor. And, you know, I know I'm in the media a lot now. But I understand and that, that really resonated more than anything because I think it is that. You're giving people the ability to have hope to say, hey, I can make money no matter how things are. Be, you know, you just got to be intelligent. Speaking of money, I need to pay the bills real quick. Support for Where Is This Going comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below-the-belt grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for all of your family jewels. Do you have a you have a little manscaping story? Are you, any thoughts on <laughs> manscaping, John? Good hygiene. That's <laughs> about it. Uh, Manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer. Their lawnmower 2.0 has proprietary skin-safe technology, so this trimmer will not nick or snag your nuts. Manscaping accidents are finally a thing of the past, and you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code WTG at manscaped.com. That's code WTG at manscaped.com for 20% and free shipping. And John, your balls will thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So I want to take a quick pivot, and uh, I'm curious as to, uh, you know, I mean, it's noted you were heavily involved with the Gotti family. Uh, since then, you guys are on bad terms, uh, fair to say. But will you talk about your first uh, introduction to them and then how uh, over the years your, de your your relationship developed and then, you know, now to, to where it is now? I mean, when I first met them, I met them because uh, Andy Ruggiano went to prison. The father stepped in his shoes and he became the leadership in our neighborhood. And uh, so... As far as if I was going to stay in the, in the mob world, that's who I had to be around, and that's who you had to uh, answer to, and th that's exactly what I did. I mean, over the years, uh, I was used to Andy. That was uh, Ruggiano, who's a quiet guy. I was used to his ways, old school ways, and I think a lot of it was uh, I wasn't able to adjust to the the Gotti ways, which was more flamboyant. Uh, more attention-seeking, I think, than I was used to with Albert and Anthony, who were very subdued and they were very quiet and they didn't uh, take advantage of their father's position. I think that was the complete opposite when I got involved with the Gotti family. So I didn't adjust well to uh, uh, somebody like myself that's aggressive and uh, the, the strong arm for the family well, became the strong arm for the family, the shooter for the family, to answer to people that didn't do what I did. And I think that's the best way to put it. But Andy did do what I did. And so when Andy asked me to, you know, can you go do this or that, 
I didn't have no problem with it because I know he did. Albert Ruggiano was a gentleman, a tough guy with his hands, uh, very athletic like myself. He was my baseball coach, so I really looked up to him. Anthony, on the same token, was just a gentleman. So when I was around with them, they were very, you know, they liked to laugh. They liked to have fun. They didn't bullshit. We all got high. You know, I'm not saying anybody was junkies, but we all, it was part of the street. We all recreationally, you know, fooled around. And But we were all honest about what we did, and that's why I think when we try to teach kids, it, it, you know, they'll see the honesty of it because this is the street. The Gaudis, on the other hand, were doing the same things the rest of us were, but blaming everybody else to say they didn't do it. So I kind of lost respect for them. And as the years went on, uh, when Gotti went in and, you know, cooperated and did a 302, a queen of the day, and I was in prison in Brazil, uh, we, were early, we weren't on good terms at all at that time. Actually, I was supposed to hit him, his uncle, and his brother-in-law prior to me taking off. And the hit got called off. And, but still, enemy or friend, and I have a lot of respect for some of my enemies. They're my enemies, but I respect them. I lost respect for Gotti's double standards of, you know, it's okay to go in and speak to the FBI and make excuses. But when Willie Boy Johnson did it, you know, it's a death sentence and he was killed for it. So there is no excuse, you know, either you cooperate and he didn't, you know, he cooperated, got caught cooperating later on by Jerry Capisci, the Daily News and the Post. And he tried to spin it with three different stories. And uh, since then, uh, after, you know, he got caught cooperating, yeah, later on, uh, we had big falling outs with each other. Obviously, uh, I didn't like him and I didn't respect him because... Uh, he still wasn't man enough to say, yeah, this is what I did, and, you know, stand by it. That's what you did. Or, you know, change your life like you claim you did. But, you know, just recently he was in the newspapers with all Latin kings that just got convicted, 60 of them got brought in. So, you know, choose a path. If that's your path, stick with it. If that's not your path, then join in and help guys like us in second chance programs and help us help kids to go on the right path. But pick a path. Don't... Uh, you know, when it's convenient, you say one thing. When it's convenient, you say another thing, and you're doing another thing. So it's just a respect thing. I just don't have respect for him. I try to, you know, keep uh, that part of my life or that family out of my mouth these days, but very hard to because, like you asked the question, uh, they're part of my past. So I just got to be honest about it, though. What would you say if Junior was in the room here today? If you – do you have anything to say? Yeah, I mean, he's a non-entity to me, honestly, just – Pass the thing is, if you're going to stay in, and you're going to pass a message, why don't you pass something positive? You know, pass something about, you know, uh, these kids that are on the street. Pass something about racism. Pass something about something positive where we're helping humanity and young kids to have a better life than we did. That's all. He suffered a lot, too. I'm not going to say he didn't. But I can't feel bad for somebody that doesn't want to have, to be honest with, with the people. So, Do you think that the reason that they... Uh they got caught was because they were too flamboyant or they were too, I mean, you know, I think you in one interview say that uh, the the Gotti name was romanticized or it was, you know, people were like, oh, you know, you hear the name Gotti, you're like, oh, that's real gangster. Do you feel like uh, it's because they were trying to, you know, bounce off the fact that people knew the name and, and, and you know, they were showing off their money and everything that that's ultimately what got them in, in trouble? Well, again, because you can't, I, you know, the book was called Gotti's Rules for a reason, because the rules are one thing, they're following another. So Sammy Guevara was the underboss of the family. This is very simple, right? This is, you know, to educate people that don't know any better, and you're a little more educated, obviously, because you, you're doing, you know, these shows and stuff, so you do your homework. But Sammy Guevara was the underboss of the family. He's not out killing anybody without the permission of the boss, because if he is, he's going to get killed. So either you're the boss or you're not the boss. You're not the boss when it's convenient, and then when it's not convenient, Sammy's a serial killer. So either you're, you're heading and you're dictating for him to do what he's doing, or you're not. If you can't control him, then you're not really a good boss. You, you're weak. So if you're not the guy out there shooting, then why would any of us be afraid of you? Because what is it, what's the power behind you? So obviously the power behind you is Sammy Gravano, Johnny Cornelia, uh, Tony Roach Rampino, Willie Boy Johnson before he started, you know, being an informant, and guys like them. And, you know, myself as a younger guy, you know, as I age. But 
we are the power behind that name. Without us, you don't have a name because you're not out there doing the shooting yourself. Your son's not doing the shooting himself. You guys aren't earning. You weren't Paul Castellano. You didn't own any businesses. Uh, these are gamblers that don't pay your debt. So what should people really know about that family that impresses anybody that, you know, besides tr just being very out there, flamboyant, and then when the trouble hits, you're pointing at all of us? Now, I have another question for you that, that I think is uh, on a subject that I think is interesting. You have, you're, are you fully Albanian? Yes. So what is that distinction um, and the relationship between more like the Albanian crew and the Italian mafia? Is there any uh, resentment, any tension because because of that? Or is there, uh, and also how is that, how is your crew different from, you know, the regular Italian mafia crew? Well, you know, first of all, Albania and, and Italy are next to each other. The countries kiss each other, with, and Greece is right there. So the, the Albanians do a lot of work for the Italians. In, in Italy, everybody knows that. The Albanians are known to be very violent. They work together hand-in-hand hand with the Italians. A lot of Italians move from Italy, and they come over to Albania. It's almost a safe haven for them. And for me, as far as the Italian mafia, I have a lot of friends that still, and I have a lot of respect, and I have a lot of respect for the Gambino side of the Gambino family. I've said it over and over in interviews. I try to tell kids not to follow this life, but I do have respect for the Gambino family for what we said earlier. They don't run around like tough guys. They're not loud. They're very quiet. They're gentlemen. They're businessmen. And uh, I look at them as, you know, listen, that's your life path. You guys are men. Whether Whatever you're doing or not doing, it's your business. It's the other side that I don't like, the big mouths that aren't pulling the trigger and acting like they're pulling the trigger. Well, these guys that are selling pot, coke, and pills and running around like gangsters with cigars in their mouth, they never crack an egg. So you're just glorified drug dealers. You're not anything but that. And so the belief that, you know, the Albanians get along very well with the Italians. It's not anything that people don't, you know, a lot of my friends were Italian, actually. A lot of my old friends from the life, I still talk to people, ask me, well, I thought you don't like Italians. No, I didn't, never said that. I said that I'm Albanian, I'm proud to be Albanian. When someone says, well, is that like Italian? I said, no, that's like Albanian. I love to be Albanian. I'll never turn in, in a, a, a different side and say, did I, was I raised around Italians? Yes, but, you know, my kids are half Italian. That has nothing to do with who I am. Heritage, the blood that runs through these arms are Albanian. Both my parents were full Albanian. Now, will you also talk to me about that first time? What, what was the age that you first went to jail? Uh, I've been in and out of prison, but the first time I was ever locked up, yeah. uh, probably around 16. Wow, okay. And then for for a more serious and extended period of time, how old were you? Uh, I've been locked up for assaults and stuff like that. So, you know, 19, uh, you know, in, in, uh, actually in California, a couple of times, I, uh, stabbed an off duty police officer. I didn't know he was off duty. He got into a fight early. He jumped a friend of mine that was, uh, about five guys jumped him. I caught the guy later on and, uh, I stabbed him not knowing he was an off duty cop. And you also, you did time. So you did time in, in Brazil. Um, Will you t tell me, uh, if you don't mind, what, well, first, first off, what's the difference between, or in your experience, uh, your, being in jail in, in Brazil and, and in the United States? Oh, you know, Brazil's a different animal altogether. I mean, it's, it's more of a, a concentration camp. You know, there you don't know what's going to happen. Inmates are being raped by the guards. The inmates are being tortured, uh, we don't have lights. The lights go off for weeks at a time. Uh, the conditions, it rains inside your cells. Uh, part of your cell, it rains and you have floods. Uh, you're below, sub-below, so the air quality is very bad. Anybody that has any kind of breathing problems, those people that were dying from asthma and stuff like that. Uh, there's riots on a constant basis. I mean, hundreds of guys got killed in my prison. Uh, the food quality is... Uh, Basically, you might as well eat dog shit. There's bugs inside, rice and beans every day, seven days a week. They're in containers that are in a room that, first off, the hygiene is, uh, you know, you, you can't even think about what you're eating because it's sitting there for, you know, a year at a time and there's insects in inside it. There's rats, rodents all over the jail. There's dengue from the mosquitoes. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're brought outside at times uh, naked sitting in the sun at 120 degrees from 7 in the morning until it gets cold at night, shitting in one spot. Uh, they don't let us move during the shakedowns. Uh, we're locked in rooms, five, 600 guys, same thing. you got to shit and piss on the floors that we're all standing on. There is no seats. There's no, you know, we're standing sometimes 15 hours during those shakedowns. 
Uh, no advocate groups were ever allowed in the prison I was in. Um, so there's been all kinds of Senate hearings about closing them down. So we always had a, a, a different mentality. We were in those Brazil, Brazilian penitentiaries, me, Klaus, O. Oh, there's guys that stay in touch with me, Fratelli, uh, Justin. Uh, you know, there's about 12 guys around the world, different countries we were all in prison at where we stayed pretty tight with each other. And we had escape plans while we were there, a guy Leo from Argentina, another guy Camilo from uh, from Portugal, uh, another guy Max from Italy. Um, so uh, there was a lot of us that stayed in touch. And those jails are constant, you know, escape plans and, you know, ways to try to survive the, uh, the, the killings, the tortures. There's guns inside the jails. There's machetes and there's death run rampant there in every which way. So you can't even compare that to the States. And how long did you st stay in those Brazilian jails? Two and a half years. Wow. And was there ever a time, I mean, I could imagine where, uh, if you have one particular, like, either worst story or, or time that you were very close to getting killed inside the jail? Has that ever happened? Yeah, I mean, the guys were talking about how I was uh, really uh, a big problem for the ward. The warden ended up killing uh, one of the, he became the assistant warden. They were bringing a new warden in. One warden got killed while we were there. The second one came in. He was an ex-military police chief, and he was coming in trying to clean up the corruption, and he was trying to... You know, he was a nice guy, actually. He was trying to get friendly with us downstairs in, in our cells, and we told him, you know, nice to meet you, see you later. We didn't want nothing to do with him. And he was just kind of naive guy that was a tough guy but didn't understand the, the jail system, and the, that assistant warden had him killed uh, on the way to work, uh, on the way to school walking his child. Uh, they shot him in the head, I think, two or three times and finished him off on the floor with a couple more shots. And we knew it was the assistant warden. The assistant warden hated me. He he uh, accused me of starting uh, some of the, uh, the riots that were in the prison. One of them, I think, 16 guys got killed. And during these riots, uh, guys were being killed randomly in the jail by the warden. Uh, guys started knocking on doors of uh, different police officers. And Brazil was on CNN, and they were killing some of these cops at their front door in retaliation for what they were doing to us in jails. And it was all over the, the media. So I think the biggest part was that warden was threatening me, and he was I was the only one he was making visit. I was having uh, the consulate visits from the United States consulate had to come to visit me, and they'd meet me in his office only. They wouldn't let me meet in a, in a regular visiting room. And we had a confrontation, and he threatened me in Portuguese, and I said to him in English, and he said, I understand English. He thought I was saying it so he couldn't understand. So I said, let me change it to Portuguese for you. And then I, same thing, I went back at him and threatened his family uh, for threatening me. And I said, I'm not everybody else. Uh, you try to kill me. I said, your family goes too. So this is uh, known. I think one of the guys just did an interview about it in London and talking about how they, uh, they, he watched five of them beat me. And they asked, did I fight back? And he says, yeah, he fought back. And uh, you're not going to do much. I mean, I fought back, but, you know, obviously I got a, a pretty good beating. And, uh you know, they tried to kill me, and, you know, he was ordering a murder on me. Two guys were supposed to kill me, and I went after them, and I stabbed them. So, I mean, the, this was constant normal business there, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of witnesses, obviously, that we all stay in touch with each other. They know what happened. Uh, it's just part of the life in Brazil. Every day was survival. We had plots. Klaus was a very good friend of mine. He happened to be in the same prison, and we were in touch, and we had different plots every day to retaliate against the cops. We hired cops against cops that were in there and we were paying them off and they were hurting guys for us on, on and they were hiring guys from the street for us to hurt cops that were hurting us. So this was, you know, this is a nonstop uh, chess game between all of us. And how much better were the, the jails in the U.S.? Was it well, it's a different system, and, and, you know, we were in Allenwood at the time. Uh, there was a warden that tied me to a chair of one of the guards because she believed that I was uh, causing a lot of trouble within the prison system and corruption within the prison system, and she couldn't control it. I had an epileptic fit at the time of epilepsy, uh, and instead of sending me out because the machines weren't working, she wouldn't. She stripped me down just into my underwear, and she chained me to the uh, officer's chair. In the uh, in solitary confinement, she kept me there. I believe at that time about ten months, and she wouldn't send me out for medical attention. The guys in the hole were screaming because I was having seizures here and there. And uh, you can't fake those. You turn completely white. You 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 lose all kind of blood. So 
the nonsense, you're on camera, you're having seizures, you're tied to a, a chair. And she asked me if I would sign a, a release form saying she didn't do that if she released me back onto the compound. And that lasted about three days. They wouldn't let me use, they wouldn't let me send letters out or phones. And uh, I mean, that happens. And she locked up every Italian on the compound because she lost control of the prison. And this is a low, this is not a penitentiary. And we all said the same thing. If you can't control us, ship us to a medium or a pen. What is this just locking us down and with this bullshit excuse of investigation? See, the problem is human nature, right? You have a lot of good cops and you got some bad. And, you know, you got to blame a lot of the good cops because they need to report the bad ones that are torturing us because you have guys that are insecure and they're not tough guys. And I guess that insecurity, they try to be tough guys. And, you know, you, you challenge them. If you hit them, you get another five years. And I watch some of these cops get their teeth kicked in by certain guys and and again, you know, the answer is, well, this guy's an inmate, he's a bad guy. Well, that's not always true. I watch a really good guy give a beating to a woman cop that she deserved every bit of it because she just tortured him nonstop and he was ready to go home and she wouldn't stop fucking with the guy. So, again, it's who's training them and it's this woman that's head of the jail at that time. I forget her name. She was a Polish woman, I believe. And, you know, she's teaching them the wrong thing. And then there's guys that are good guys there was a guy that ran mckeon prison that changed it, that system around completely and there was hardly any violence there and they got rid of the warden because they didn't like that he was too soft on guys but what's the objective the objective is to control the jail without any violence he did that so i didn't understand what's that problem but the same thing with this woman in, in allenwood low she was locking us all down because she had no control she had no respect and of course you're not going to have respect but you cheat, you're treating everybody like dogs. So, you know, it just depends. I mean, systems, it's a different kind of torture is what I'm getting at in the United States. And uh, it needs to be addressed. So if somebody talks to somebody like a gentleman, you're going to get a lot more out of them than treating them like a dog. And sometimes, all right, some inmates maybe not. Well, then treat them accordingly after you try to treat them like a gentleman. But, you know, a couple bad ones are going to ruin it for the good cops. And it's like anything else. It's like the street. No different. You have insecure people and you got secure people. So I think you got to judge each buddy individual. And what's your mindset when you're um, in jail and, and doing time and, you know, in solitary and sometimes getting beaten up? Was it, did you ever get, uh, I mean, you know, you're, you're a confident guy, but do you ever get broken? Um, you know, do you ever lose hope? Do, or did it, did it, did at that point where you maybe like, I kind of regret some of these things, or when I get out, I'm going to change. Well, the problem is when you're in there, and you know, everybody says they're going to change. Everybody finds religion. Not everybody, but you know what I mean. A good majority of guys, because you're suffering. Right. And then your memory forgets real quick, you know, short-term memory of uh, what happened to you. But, yeah, when you're in there, there's times when I thought I was really weak, and I said, man, did I, you know, did, did uh, you know, I'm not as strong as I thought. You know, you get you question yourself and you, you feel like you're broken in a, in, in a lot of ways. And then, you you know, the next day you wake up and you, you dust yourself off and you're back at it again and you're strong. I mean, listen, the repetitiveness of solitary confinement, especially when you don't get books and radios and commissary, is torturous because every morning and the next day you're looking forward to exactly what you're looking for, nothing. Just time standing still, no way to occupy yourself besides doing some push-ups running in place. But you can't do that for 24 hours. You can do that for three maybe, four if it's a lot, and then what? Uh, so you have nothing to look forward to in solitary confinement besides just sitting there looking at four walls day in and day out. People have no idea what that is. And I've said over and over again, part of training for these officers that work solitary confinement stints is they should have to be in there for a month. And they know they're getting out in 30 days, but give them 30 days so they understand what it is uh, when they're in there, when an inmate's in there, what it is to ask for toilet paper to, to wipe your ass after your shit and they don't want to give it to you. And what it is when people are going through, not just jail, but, you know, they're losing family members out in the street or their wife just left them or their kid got locked up or somebody's sick in their family. There's things that also, uh, you know, really inflame the situation. And so part of that is... A lot of these cops, you get a lot of good cops, actually, and, and people will tell you in prison that are, you know, really kind. They got good hearts. They feel terrible. They, they look at you, and know, they try to talk to you a little bit. And then you got some real pieces of shit that really try to, you know, make it as miserable as possible on you. I had a parole officer, and to get off the subject, it was a Sharon O'Brien. 
great parole officer. You know why she was a great parole officer? And people ask me, why did you like this woman so much? Because she didn't try to make and hope that I'm going to do something wrong so she can violate me. You got some of these sadistic parole officers are trying to violate you. That's not their job. Their job is to try to help you, try to help you get another job, try to change your mindset, try to make you change your life. So Sharon was one of those people that was trying to help me change my life, which I give her a lot of credit for why I changed my life. She's one of them. There's a couple of people that helped me change my life and say, hey, you're worth something more than what you're doing. Change your life for yourself. And, you know, she re- I give her a lot of, really, really helped me. And then you have other parole officers that are, all they're doing is going out of the way, trying to catch the guy, do something wrong, and so they can violate him, or trying to find something, not even catch him, find something maybe they're not even doing to violate him. And that's where the system gets screwed up because their job is really try to give them the confidence to go help them to, to, to get through that parole time, probation time, and go out in the, in the world and do the right thing. And you know, instead of that mentality of let's try to put them back in jail, and that, that's a big problem with what's going on in the United States, I think with some of the, you know, the, the, the stuff with jail became such a business that uh, you know, they're trying to go out of the way to violate some of these young kids. And the, some of these young kids need somebody to, to support them. And if you have the right person support, maybe they'll change their lives too. Did you ever, in in your time in jail, think about, um, you know, perhaps some of the people that you that you killed, some of them that uh, their families? I mean, I know you you talked uh, in one interview about reaching out to families when you got out um, of perhaps people you killed. I mean, does you know, and that, even today, do you still think about those people? Do you? What's that like for you now? You know, I, I did something that said, yes, I did. And I said, yes, I did this. Yes, I did that. I remember and that. One of my last things, he got very famous. But yes, I did. I reached out to people constantly that I hurt or shot or stabbed or some of the family members I killed. And, you know, I have so many people that I hurt in that life. I mean, hundreds. I mean, what... That, go ahead. Sorry. I, I know in, in, in that interview that you're talking about, um, I think you estimated it like beating... Uh, beating people with baseball bats, maybe over 100 people. I mean, and then in terms of, like, killings, you're not 100% sure. We just maybe estimate, uh, for people who didn't listen to that interview, what we're talking about in terms of killings and beatings and stuff like that over your time. Killings, I'd say about 15. I'm not to shoot on all of them, maybe a little more than that. Uh, I mean, I, I got involved in a shooting with Angelo Costelli and Joey Dank. I didn't ever talk about that too much. I think it's in my next book, but Dark is How Toy came out with another book coming out, and... You know, I went in, they called me, they had trouble on Liberty and 111th Street, and I walked in, and the guy threatened them. I put a pull stick across one guy's head. He hit me, and Angelo shot them both. And I don't know how he didn't shoot me, and I'm pretty sure they died for sure. I think the one kid died. So, you know, it's hard to say because we right. don't stick around and say, is this guy dead? And, you know, me and Frankie killed two guys on my property. We killed some. With uh, the four Jamaicans, I believe, so, you know, a couple of them died. So when someone says to me, well, I don't know. I mean, we're not sitting in... in, in sitting there getting their name and number and who are they and did they definitely die and we didn't care if they did or didn't at the time we're on my property when i shot the three guys and i I know i executed the one for sure i think the second died and i don't know what happened to the third but we were just talking about that and it was guys that regular guys that were involved with me in that cleaning it up getting rid of guns and and who knows we didn't you know you're not sitting so it's really hard to say i shot this guy tt in the head and this other tt not my friend tt and he lived, and I shot another guy, and he died a month later. Did they charge me with the murder? Or, uh, I baseball batted three guys that were threatening my friend Joe, who was a regular guy, and one guy went to coma, and somebody told me he died. I don't know if he did or didn't. So where does that number really go? Uh, the point is, I did it. I shot everybody, and you know, like I said, yes, I did. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. I shot a guy, Mike Levigny, in the chest. I talked about that. He testified against me 25 years later. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't have qualms if they live, die, shoot them in the head, not shoot them in the head. Some of these shootings, when I'm not the actual shooter, but there, some of them I am the shooter. Uh, I don't know. I mean, some of the conspiracies, uh, Frankie Geeky, uh, Ruggiano's brother-in-law, uh, put his hands on uh, Albert and Anthony's mother. So, you know, I was involved in a plot of killing him, and Anthony was, uh, obviously, it's his mother who was involved in that murder. Um, so... I mean, there's one after another. There's too many to really discuss. And during the uh, the time when the judge was sentencing me, she actually said he just got hurt too many people, stabbed too many people, shot too many people. It'll take us all day to sit here and 
and uh, go through it, let's just say, in a certain amount of numbers over this. But, you know, again, you're talking about a 30-year career of what I'm doing. It ain't that much like everybody thinks over there. For being a violent guy in a, a strong arm or whatever word you want to use, a uh, professional killer for a family uh, is really not a lot of guys because I'm doing it day in and day out for 30 years. Um, I don't, you know, it, to me, it's not important. The reason why I don't sugarcoat it is because I'm trying to teach these kids that, yeah, I was this guy and it was a wrong life. And you guys don't have to do what I did to prove anything. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. And it's like I'm talking about somebody different, not myself. And I think that we, me and my brother, my brother also was accustomed to violence since we're kids. We grew up around violence, about fighting in the street, fighting at home, boxing, that it was just a natural thing for us. And uh, my brother didn't do what I did killing. I mean, me and my brother were in a car a couple times, and some guy pulled over, and there was over a little dispute, and he followed us. Well, he made a mistake. He jumped out of the car with a bat or a pipe. I figure which one it was. And me and my brother, this is in Jersey, and we pulled over and we took the bat off him and clobbered him to death. I don't know what happened to him either because, you know, once I start going, I didn't want to stop. And, and I said, well, if it was my brother alone and he could have batted him, uh, who knows what would happen. So when me and my brother got the bat, that was it for the guy. But, you know, the, the, the point is the violence was a normal pattern for me and it wasn't because I lost control of myself I was always pretty controlled I always thought things out and I never got caught with a crime actually it's not I and mean, I've said this over and over again yeah, how did you not get caught over this this time I mean what's that cover-up looking like after a, a well shootout? you know you got the 80s first off was a different era no cameras number one second witnesses were afraid to come forward I shot a guy in the Hamptons for Johnny Koenig's son. They beat him up, and I pulled him over as a detective with uh, Johnny Ruggiero who drove. I've, I haven't talked about that shooting, I believe. I shot another guy for Johnny Ruggiero at the swim club, uh, and that, that, the guy that owned the club at the time, Fritzy, he's dead. He was a captain of Genovese family. He called me afterwards and joked about it. He says, I, I would have let you shoot him downstairs. Said, you should just, just call me. Why'd you do it that way? I go, Fritz, I didn't know it was your joint. So, you know, there's so many shootings I did that, uh, it just was a natural thing, and I think that, uh, you know, we just got to, I, I really don't know. I just think that being honest about it is what helps kids to understand what I'm saying, not to follow this, because. And I had asked you about, uh, I think I maybe interrupted you about your conversations with uh, some of the families or some of the people that you did shoot. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and I'm just curious about what, what those look like and, and, you know, how do you, how did you reach out, um, their reactions, all of that? Well, some of them were nice. Some of them I talked to. Some of them forgive me. Some of them were gangsters. Some of them and their family members tried to kill me. And there was one kid in particular, Andrew Forte, he wasn't a particularly tough kid. He was a drug dealer. I reached out to him. He told me to go fuck myself. And I am who I am still. And, I, and then I told him. Uh, I think it was through... Uh, maybe one of the media, social media, Facebook. I said, go fuck yourself. You know what? I try to be a gentleman, but you ain't no innocent guy. I said, you're sitting there fucking selling rocks to everybody that there's a lot of people who got sick over you, got died over you, everything. So, you know, I'm trying to be changed my life, be a nice guy. But on the other hand, if you don't accept my apology, I, got, I ain't losing no sleep over you. Go fuck yourself that we robbed you and beat you up a little bit. So actually at the time when we beat him up and robbed him, I didn't want to do it. It was done. I actually asked them to kick me in the face so it looked like I was involved in the robbery. I didn't want to do it. But anyway, the point being, this, this guy is acting like I robbed a guy like he owned the supermarket and I robbed him. So I, I don't have any, I don't lose any sleep. I try to be in, you know, change my life and move forward. But since he didn't want to accept the apology, I did say to him, now go fuck yourself too. You know, I tried and I really don't give a shit that you don't accept it. Now you say, um, and you've said in, in a couple other interviews as well, that uh, you know, you, you've changed your life, but you're still the same person. Um, how, how different, I mean, you know, in the sense that you're not killing people now, but how much of, how different are you? In what ways are you different? Well, I don't want to commit crimes anymore, and I want to make sure the young kids that know me don't want to commit crimes or even think about committing crimes because I don't want them to suffer what I suffer and I want them to enjoy their lives. You know, every day that you're not enjoying your life and you're in a prison, if we call the prison and, and ask guys, how is it? Guys that are always gonna say the positive ones, well, it's, it's okay, it's fine. Because you have to say that so you can get through the time and you make it as easy as possible on yourself. But 
when you come home and you can me and you can go out after this is done and we can open your refrigerator. You can't do that in prison. Or you want to go lay down in your bed without a guard telling you make your rack. Or, you know, you got to go to the bathroom and, uh, you know, your cellmate saying you got to put a towel up and you got to ask, can you leave out of the room? Or, or on and on and on. To taking a shower and there's shit in the shower and people are jerking off in the shower and you got to step on that so you got to wear shower slides. You know, this is not life. And, you know, we can fly and go to Fort Lauderdale and lay on the beach. They can't. So anybody that says, well, jail's not that bad, they're full of shit. You know, jail does, I'm not talking about the violence is, everybody lives with that part of it, but you can have violence on the street. I'm talking about your freedoms. The freedom to see your family, the freedom to see your kids, the freedom to see your wife, your freedom to, to have sex, get laid, uh, you know, the freedom to watch a movie. is You know, it's not there when you're in prison and it's not, that's not normal way of living. You know? And you've been uh, also open about um, having PTSD from, from all of this. Will you talk about what PTSD uh, you've kind of faced and how you, and I know you, you go to therapy and, and you've been open about that as well, and how, um, how that still affects you on a daily basis and how perhaps therapy, perhaps going on long walks, perhaps whatever it is you do to, uh, to kind of help yourself and, and how much of that, 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 that post-traumatic stress is, uh, will maybe never go away. Well, it's post-traumatic stress disorder for people that don't know. I got a lot of friends that were in the forces, and my friend Lance, I brought him up recently. These guys have seen a lot of action all over, and they have it, and there's ways to try to control it. Uh, I think it's from a lot of, you know, obviously being involved with a lot of death, a lot of violence. Um, you have that anxiety because if there's a problem, with you, you don't, you're not trying to hurt anybody anymore, so you get that anxiety. Sometimes you stand and have a conversation, you get a little light. You get different symptoms, but you get a little lightheaded and a little, you know, you feel like you got to hold on to something. It depends. Uh, sometimes you can't have these conversations because you're not up to it. But you learn ways to try to control it. Um, you, you don't particularly like if someone's going to try to screw with you. Uh, so you got to find ways to keep yourself calm, not to react the way you used to. And... Uh, a lot of these guys that have uh, PTSD and uh, a lot of guys in armed forces stay in touch with me, send me messages from around the world or send me messages around here. And we talk and we relate and I try to bring it to the forefront for guys to get help uh, through therapy like I do. Yesterday I went to see my therapist because I've been having a little, last couple of weeks a little rough time with you know stuff. And, and it, that's what also helps me to uh, continue to, you know, to deal with it the way I want to deal with it now. Before I was embarrassed to say I went there. Now I tell everybody it's not the wrong way to go to it. You know, it releases things. You you also say um, that you don't have any uh, any regrets about it, and that you also say that if you miss if you don't say you miss if you say that you don't miss the life, you're lying. How do you um, you know in what ways perhaps do you miss it, uh, and why why would someone miss it? Um, is it the thrill? that you, uh, it's a different kind of thrill that you don't get anymore. Do you, what aspects do you miss? What aspects don't you miss? Well, you're going to obviously miss that kind of money, uh, but there's other ways to make it. And then there's, you're going to miss the fun that we used to have as a group. Constantly guys always, you know, calling each other and taking off and doing whatever. And then you're going to miss the adrenaline. But I said there's other ways you can get adrenaline rushes. I think anybody from the streets, the sports, to any kind of activity like that, anything where you're dangering yourself, uh, motorcycle, lacrosse, uh, or uh, car racing, I think those are just big adrenaline junkies that you gotta find ways to excite yourself. And uh, I think, but you know, you find different ways to excite yourself. And I think uh, anybody that was in armed forces, as bad as it is, PTSD, that thrill after the shooting starts and after it's over is a high that you know, because you survived, right? Because you accomplished your mission, because of different things. Now you go back and you're like, you're all psyched up because you just, you didn't die, you know, you got through it. Uh, and, but on the other hand, you're gonna relive it, even though you think you're not. Subconsciously, if you don't, you know, relive it consciously, you're gonna relive it. Do you maybe perhaps regret being as loyal as you were? Yeah, in a way, I think I was a little, you know, as, as street smart as I was, I was naive too. I thought, you know, my friends like the, the Joneses or Peter Graham or Michael Jacobs or uh, Richie Langston that I, you know, these are true friends since we're kids and we look out for each other and there's a loyalty to them. 
And I thought when I was dealing with these street guys uh, that I'd get the same loyalty. But you don't. If you're making them money, they're loyal. As soon as the money's gone, they're not. When you ask them to, with a handout after you did everything for them, will they put their hand out and help you? They won't. I, and you know, there's guys like Keith Pellegrino who I babysat him since he's a kid. He's not a tough guy. He was didn't know how to make money. He was an ex-drug addict. And I did everything for him. Yet, as soon as things got a little thick, he ran away. And then yet, when I needed something, he was nowhere to be found. And then I found out he was involved and had the knowledge of our other friend getting killed. And he's not a tough guy. So I look at these guys and I'm like, how do they live with themselves? I'd love to sit with them and go, you know, and you know, talk about different guys bringing on shows. And, well, bring, bring yourself on a show. And nobody knows who you are, but we'll introduce you. And let's explain how you're okay with what you did. You know, because I was nothing but good to you. How is it that you don't feel the same loyalty that you owe me something over the years to do the right thing and put your hand out? So, you know, I don't think you can explain it because it's not in their DNA to be good guys. They're full of shit. They're only around for the good shit and not the bad. And I'm also curious, um, you have four kids? Yeah. And I think in, when, again, one interview you said you talk about uh, how with, I think, a couple of them, it, it was hard um, when you went to jail and, and your relationships with them were, were tough. How has, you know, family life and, and being a father through parts of these times of your life and going through jail and how has that worked out? And, and, and then, you know, how do you, once you got out, tell yourself, okay, uh, do you take on the role of being a father even more now because you're not in that life? I think you're obviously going to have guilt. Because anybody that's been in the street, I think we all have the same problem with our kids. It's a different generation. We were raised different with our fathers. It's a new generation. So I think there's some uh, guilt on my end, and then there's animosity from the kids' end, and then there's some suffering on the kids' end because they're not accustomed to people trying to kill them like I am. I just take it as a natural stride. You know, all through my life, nothing's changed for me. Guys always still want to kill me. So... You know, I just nonchalant about it. You know, I, you know, obviously I live a certain way, and I don't, I don't hide. I'm still in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia area, and uh, I just take it as part of my life as always been. But on my kids' end, it's not. It's a, it's a big deal to them, and uh, they don't want to be gangsters. I don't want them to be gangsters. I don't want them to get in trouble. I don't want them to live like I did. So my kids are no different, I guess, than. Uh, you know, a lot of these other guys, well, we'll talk about Gotti. He, I know he's had trouble with his kids over the years, and this is the part where I don't understand why he doesn't come forward and try to help some kids and then just shut the fuck up about you know, the name, the bullshit stuff, and try to help some kids and help your own kids because I know all of us have to have trouble with our kids that live this life. And, and, you know, some of the guys I know, like uh, TT or anybody else that had kids, if we're in, sh in jail in the street, how are those kids, you know, living while we're away? Of course they're suffering in different ways because, you know, the parents not there and you know, financially things are struggle because you're going to lose everything when you go to prisons and jail and as soon as they swoop in on you, everything's going to be gone. And uh, I think it's very important that the guys like, you know, and that's why I think guys like Michael, you know, Harry O'Harris is, you know, did 30 years, 31 years, actually. Uh, they understand it. So, you know, when people say there's not guys like Michael in prison that are helping young guys, there are. There was guys that talked to me when I was in prison. I just wasn't ready to hear it yet. And it took Michael 31 years, and he's advocating for kids in prison and, and on the street from prison, which is commendable, right? Because you need guys and you need these kids to understand, hey, we were the real guys really doing what we were doing and we're telling you don't do what we did it's nothing but suffering there's so many other things you can do and uh you know i feel bad because my oldest son suffered a lot from my life and there's consequences that he's suffering today because of my life and it seems like the groups that's supposed to be protecting him i'm talking a law, law uh, court system and the law enforcement side they don't really nobody seems to care or doesn't want to really address the true facts like i said about black lives matter you could say that phrase Sounds great, right? It's a cool phrase. But what is anybody really doing? I mean, I don't, I don't see anybody really doing anything. Let's go. I can take you to Brownsville. I'm going to show you kids all over the street. Nobody's helping. You know, let, let's really do something for them besides just tell that bullshit phrase. I can't stand that no one really cares about them. You know? Do you, so you, you also mentioned um, that you know, there's still people that want to kill you. Do you feel 
How, how do you live your life knowing that? And do you, do you still feel like every day you're in danger? I mean, do you still have to like look behind you? Do you like wherever you're going? Do you feel that? Nah, I, I sit with my back to the door all the time. I go wherever I want to go. I mean, listen, when I lived a life, I was I always lived a certain way, and I took certain. I'm not an idiot. I take, you know, certain ways I live, and that hasn't changed from then till now, and it's never going to change. It's my life since I was active, not active, but. Uh, it doesn't bother me, no, not at all. And then there are also, you know, for the, for the some people who say, oh, you know, he got out, maybe didn't do enough time, this, that, the other thing. Do you feel like, you know, if someone were to come and and try to mess with you, do you still feel like you have a little bit of that dangerous, you know, side that you had before, that no. violent side? Oh, I know that all that violent side of me. Not a little bit of it. I know it's me. I mean, I didn't change. Does that I'm, scare you ever? No, because I know how to control it now. You know, I might get mad, and you'll hear me cursing and screaming, and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you'll be like, wow, he didn't change. And I'll say, yeah, I did change, because I didn't react physically. Before, anybody that knew me say, wow, this guy's like heckling Joe, because I didn't yell that much. i just uh, say quietly, do this. If you didn't do it, I'd come for you. You know, and they'd say, I can't believe he just did that. He didn't even warn me. Yes, I did. I didn't need to yell to warn you. But now... I, I raise my voice a little more, I guess, because I don't have the physical reaction I used to. But I learned, like, when you exercise, it's not physical, it's also mental. So I think in jail, when I talk about positive time, I have a book out with Nick, the, Nick Christopher called uh, Prison Rules, and we talk about positive time. Have faith, have a religion, stay in a music room, work out. But it's not for physical, sometimes it's for mental. And same with Susan Pike, I did that book, Dr. Sal, and we talk about this, and George Anastasia talked about some things, and God, he's ruled. So some of these things are my life, and I try to convey it to the kids to understand that mental strength is, is, is more important than physical strength. To wrap things up, how do you hope to be remembered? I want to be remembered for what I'm doing today, not what I used to do, for what I'm trying to accomplish with the kids, uh, racism, uh, some of the positive things. I want to be a, a, a not known for all the negative crap. Yes, I did shit. But yes, I did save kids' lives now. And that's what I want to be known for. There's a couple books you have out. Do you want to just quickly pitch them to, to people who can and all? You know, I mean, we're going to have your website up. We're going to have uh, johnallite.com. I mean, everything's going to be there. But if you just want to talk briefly to, to well, people. Well, I think uh, the biggest things I'm doing now is Second Chance Program. And that's real important for me because that's going to save kids' lives uh, the alightsports.com is uh, helping people that are going to gamble uh, legally or illegally. At least you have an edge with me. And uh, Peter, my partner uh, in, out in Colorado. And my next book, Darkest Hour 2, I think is going to be a, a really great success because it talks uh, not so much about, uh, it talks about the mob, but it talks about all the violence I committed and where and the running and the Brazilian penitentiaries and the, the, all that really gets into depth with that. So I think it's going to be cool. And they can find all that on johnnalight.com, yeah? Yeah, they can find that on my website. Beautiful. And uh, my agent and uh, David Nash from uh, his website uh, from uh, London, great guy. John, it was uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on my show. Um, you know, it's it's weird when you when I start a show like this, you don't know really who's you're gonna have on. I mean, we were talking just uh, before we started. You know, I have people like Christina Hutchinson. I'll have a UFC fighter. I'll have uh, an artist. I'll have. I think X, she's, y, a, she's a great interview, and I think she's a great person. And I say back to people that judge, like she said, "Well, fuck them if they don't like me." Exactly. I like the way she speaks and what she talks, and that she's straight. Whatever she is, is who she is. So I like it. So it was a pleasure to have you on, sir. And uh, I you wish you, much. I wish you all the best in uh, in this next life. Thank you. Thanks, I really man. appreciate. It.